Okay, welcome. All right, so we will now begin and uh, welcome to the webinar uh, for the IPM Toolbox series um, entitled Want to Know How to Create an IPM Plan? Confused about Scouting Greenhouse Tomatoes? Learn from an IPM Expert How to Do Both. And so today we're wait, uh, welcoming Katie Campbell Nelson. So hi, Katie. Hi. Hi. All right, so um, <clears throat> before we begin, there is going to be a recording of this webinar and um, it's going to be um, available within a week um, on this um, link and you'll see a link to it on our main, main website. Um, there is going to be an opportunity for lots of Q&A time on this call and so you're invited to submit a question at any time and if you put your mouse over the bottom of your screen you should see a menu that pops up and there's a Q&A feature um, there, you just click on that and you can enter your question and uh, we'll take uh, a few moments to stop and answer those questions as we go through. And uh, there's also an option there to ask a question anonymously and um, I actually can't see it on my screen but I believe um, you check on, on the side and you can ask a question anonymously. And uh, so, so uh, now we've got the, the Zoom sorted out, I'm going to introduce Katie. So Katie Campbell Nelson is an extension educator for the University of Massachusetts Vegetable Program with a background in soil and nutrient management and sustainable agriculture. She has expanded a highly successful New England vegetable scouting and pest alert network. She conducts research and provides educational programming for vegetable farmers in Massachusetts and is an editor of Vegetable Notes a publication with practical and up-to-date research-based information that reaches over 2,600 growers. And um, I just had the pleasure of spending some time with Katie and a couple of uh, farmers recently in Massachusetts. And we'll be sharing some video during, um, during this webinar of uh, Katie uh, scouting some tomatoes and uh, also uh, talking with a farmer about creating an IPM plan. So I feel very grateful that Katie is taking time out of her really busy schedule during the spring season um, to, to, to be on the call with us today. Um, so Katie, uh, tell me, what do you love about farming in your current work? Well, um, I love working with growers on applied research specifically because it feels really uh, like direct practical science. It's the best of both worlds for me. I am able to work on things that farmers on their own aren't necessarily able to implement, uh, but with some help, they're able to try new and different practices. Um, and so I really enjoy doing that. Great. And did you grow up in a farm? I grew up in a subsistence agricultural community in Timor in Indonesia. And everybody there farms so it's um it's sort of a, a funny idea that because here we have only about two percent of our farmers are uh of our population but in indonesia it's about 60 percent of the population and so it's not to ask somebody what they love about farming is is a funny way to think about it but i do think about it a lot so thanks for asking that question great wonderful all right, so um, we're just going to talk a little bit about the Northeast Vegetable Scouting and Pest Alert Network, and I'm sure some people who are on the webinar are not familiar with it. Could you uh, describe what the network does? Yeah, so um, the Vegetable Scouting and Pest Alert Network was a grant that was funded by the Northeast IPM Center from 2014 to 2016, and we already have a great network in place of extension educators and scouts all over New England, but this was the first time to bring in a few new people and sort of update the way that we were, we were doing uh, the scouting. So what we did differently was we brought in Anne Hazelrig and Andy Radin, Anne Hazelrig from Vermont and Andy Radin from Rhode Island, and then we added educators from, <clears throat> excuse me, a bunch of other states. New York, New Hampshire, Maine, um, and Mass, Rhode Island, Vermont. We get on weekly phone calls and we use very similar scouting procedures in order to 
go out to vegetable fields. We cover about 10 in the state of Massachusetts and each uh, scout extension educator in their own states have s staff that are scouting in their states. And then weekly we, we get together and, and share information and then put out alerts so that uh, farmers and growers all across New England can get very up-to-date information. Great, and those are shared by email? Right, so we um, share these observations through our newsletter, Vegetable Notes, that reaches about 2,600 growers. And each extension uh, organization that's involved uses the information in their own way for their own newsletters. And I should also mention that we use um, other information like the, the Network for Environmental and Weather Applications through Cornell, NUA. We use forecasting models out there. Uh, so we use weather information, forecasting models for specific pests, and we sort of combine all that data with real observations in the field. And um, so what geographic region do you cover? These alerts go to all New England states. Okay, and um, and presumably they go to farmers and extension educators. And do you right? Yeah. So um, some home gardeners, other ag service providers, um, NRCS, mostly our growers though are our readers. Okay, great. And um, I think you put a couple of slides in here about the resources that are available uh, through the network. Would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about each one? Right. So we're, we're going to watch a video coming right up about how to create an IPM plan. And after growing, uh, working with farmers for a really long time, um, we developed this, this method for developing a plan. But I'll just mention that we use vegetable notes. The New England Vegetable Management Guide is updated every two years. Uh, we also have our website where you can find all of our, this is the web, website of the Pest Scouting Network grant that was funded by NEIPM. And at the bottom of this page, as well as linked through a Google Doc, um, if you, yep, you can access all of the resources. So scouting forms, scouting ID guides, a toolkit for a, for a scouting box for the back of your truck, for example. So all this information is is going to be available. Maybe should we stop now and take a few questions before we go on to talking about IPM plans or? Yeah, absolutely. And as I can say, if people didn't notice as well, uh, there are URLs at the bottom of um, at this page and the last page that shows you um, how to link to the two sites that we're showing you, the Google Drive and um, the Pest Scouting Network webpage. So just in case people didn't catch that, they're right there. And um, yeah, so we have two people who are, who are checking questions. Do we have, uh, Nancy, do you see any questions about the uh, Scouting and Pest Alert Network? Uh, there are two questions for Katie. Uh, there's nothing on the chat, just the questions. Uh, the first one is, Katie has an interesting background in farming. How do practices internationally compare with what is done here in the U.S.? That's a good question. I just spent a month in Indonesia this March and noticed I was in the island of Timor and there is no extension service. So growing up, I always wanted to do extension work, but didn't even know it existed until I came to the U.S. And uh, I think a lot of farmers in the U.S. don't know that the extension service exists here. So... Um, and I'm, I'm just answering a question about how IPM is used. There's actually a huge IPM network in Indonesia, but, but parts of it are so rural and there's no extension service that it, it's very difficult to get around. So we're very lucky to have uh, such tight networks regionally of, of extension educators and um, other resources, agricultural service resources. Great. The second question is, why did you specifically refer to the network as scouting? That seems pretty narrowly focused. How much do you rely on word of mouth about your network versus active promotion? Mm, okay. Uh, so scouting, I, 
it, it's very, I use that word because that's the very basis of what we do. It's sort of, um, to get an alert out to growers, you, you want to know that someone actually observed and scouted and saw that there was an issue and that that, that pest issue um, was confirmed and diagnosed. And so I've, I've very specifically refer to scouting. And as far as the other question was, let's see, um, how do we rely on getting this? Our, uh, do we rely on word of mouth or promotion? I, I don't even know how it's grown, but we, I, you know, we have presentations, we do field walks, we get around regionally. Um, and since I started working in the vegetable program, we've raised our readership from 2000 to about 2600 in a couple of years. So I, I don't know how it gets out there, but it seems like a lot of people know about vegetable notes. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Okay, we'll come back to more questions. Um, we're going to talk about IPM planning now. And uh, Katie, what is an IPM plan? Right. So uh, an IPM plan is a way of, well, we, we worked with growers, say, about 30 or 40 over the last three years to develop plans. And we sit down with the grower at the beginning of the season, maybe an hour or two and go over their, the crops of, of greatest interest, greatest importance to them. Talk about how they may have controlled these pests in the past and then discuss what they'd like to do this year or this season. And very importantly, you know, this is a negotiation. This is a conversation we have with a grower that, that implementing IPM isn't necessarily, you know, it, Yes, we're, we're there to minimize the impacts on the environment, but it's also to improve the quality of the life of the farmer. And, and so we talk about their goals. So we set some goals down and some, some actionable calendar alerts when during the season to begin and have some other important notes. So, so in doing this, we, we've worked with growers, usually work with growers in a one to three years with these plans and, and follow up after preparing a plan. We'll follow up with weekly visits through the season. Um, and I think we have a video clip of Tyson is one of the farmers we worked with talking about how he uses the plan. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe um, since we don't have Tyson here to introduce himself, maybe you could just say who Tyson is. And... Oh, sure. Yeah. Tyson Newkirk is a, a farm educator at the farm school in Athol, Massachusetts. And he um, has worked with, he works with about 15 growers a year and trains them in, in vegetable production. And one of the things we worked with him on was developing an IPM plan to train his students. So, Okay, great. So just give me a moment because I have to do some uh, wizardry here to uh, see Tyson's uh, clip. And... Okay, so are, can you see the blank screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, we started working with uh, Katie and UMass formally, I think in 2012, um, was our first year uh, working as a partner farm. Um, and so that was the first time that um, I had sat down and put together a cohesive plan explicitly for IPM as such. Um, and then we, that was a tool we continue to update and use and then reuse as a tool for kind of providing some uh, context for looking back at what we had done, looking forward to what we wanted to do. Um, and for me, it's become a really useful tool um, just in terms of uh, it, it gives you time and forces you to sit back and think about what has been successful and what you'd like to change and then make a plan for going forward. It becomes an operational plan just like a crop plan does um, so that you're not caught uh, in the heat of a moment uh, during the season when you're trying to do a thousand different things, you've actually created a, a, a cohesive plan for yourself that you can be preventative um, and be really uh, on top of your IPM. So it's a really useful tool. And I'm actually just in the process of finishing the revision of last year to so get ready for this year. Great, wonderful. And um, let me just go back to uh, our PowerPoint. Okay, great. 
Okay. So, um, so you can see from that clip from Tyson that he has found working with you and working with the plans be a really useful thing. And it sounds like uh, doing it before the growing season gets going is the time to do it. So for some people in the Northeast, that is still the case while we're waiting for the ground to dry out and warm up. So, um, so Katie, what uh, tools do you offer um, um, to, for people to create an IPM plan? Uh, well, we just went over some of those uh, just a few slides back when um, I recommend that growers use the resources of, of their own extension services. Um, Cornell has a great vegetable management guide and has a publication specifically for organic growers. Um, and we, as I mentioned before, we produce the New England Vegetable Management Guide. Um, but oh, we also have these resources to prepare you for scouting, which are scouting forms that help you take detailed records. And we have this template, which is an IPM plan template. Um, and I liked what Tyson said there about uh, these IPM plans being just like a crop plan and you wouldn't think about going into the season without one so why wouldn't you for managing your pests as well and this is a great way i think we we've tried to simplify this system and i have a i have a few examples i can go through okay i was going to say i know you put a couple of examples together so maybe you could talk us through this right so for example how do you you know you might wonder how a grower picks which crops and pests to focus on in the year. And here in Massachusetts, I work with a lot of diversified growers who have maybe 30 or 40 different vegetable crops. And it's hard to say, well, what's your most important crop? Which, which one are we going to focus on this year? And um, a grower might pick something, for example, beet spinach Swiss chard doesn't seem like a very high cost crop for a lot of growers, but it may be important to them if they have a, a CSA because it's an important component of their share. But on the other hand, it may be a pest. Leaf miner is a pest that many of these small diversified farms can spend a lot of time on if they're, they're going through each leaf on a, in a, even a hundred or 200 row feet and picking out leaves that have been infested with leaf miner. That's a time consuming and not a labor efficient practice. So we had a farm, this is a, an example from one farm. And in the past they tried covering plants, but they may be covered too late and they were cutting the leaves out the affected leaves and they, they weren't pleased with this strategy. So for 2017, they decided to move the spring crop far from last year's crop, scout for eggs, and spray and trust when eggs were observed, because this is a proven uh, control method. method. Um, once the eggs hatch and get into the leaf, there's no longer, this was an organic grower, there's no longer an effective organic uh, control because the, the leaf miner is inside the plant and, and trust is not systemic. So the goal of this farmer was less le labor for good quality crop, and they, they give themselves an alert, May 1st, because that was the date that they first had these crops, uh, transplants and seedlings sprouting in the field. Then in the notes section, they sort of threw in, okay, what are the important things I need to know about a leaf miner life cycle? So they threw that in there. So this is your, your sort of simplified IPM plan for that crop. Uh, the next example I have is for tomato, high tunnel tomato. And it's pretty cold here in Massachusetts right now, and I imagine that's where most of our growers are right now, is in their high tunnels, scouting their potato aphids. <laughs> um, that seems to be a, a, a heavy pest um, right now, I've noticed in a lot of high tunnels. And uh, in the past, the, the grower that I worked with had sanitized the tunnel and and removed debris or sprayed with insecticidal soap, but wasn't getting um, effective control. And this grower hadn't really hadn't used biological controls before and wanted to learn. And so they did a little bit of research and found that you can use Aphidius ervi for potato aphid. First, they had to make sure they actually had potato aphid, which is a 
aphids, it turns out, are really a pain to identify um, correctly. Uh, and then you could also add to a biological mix, Aphelinus abdominalis, and maybe some lady beetles. But they were sort of still unsure about, you know, timing of release and all that information. So they contacted us and, you know, I've done, I'm not an entomologist by trade. And um, so I, I don't have a lot of experience with biological controls, but the great part of working in, in extension is you have a lot of resources. So I asked around and um, I would recommend that this grower go to some of the companies out there that work with biological controls, uh, BioBest, Copert, um, Great Lakes IPM, Carol Glenister at Great Lakes is a really great resource. She has answered a lot of questions for growers. So that's what this grower did. And um, he really wanted to reduce the impact that aphids have in his tomato tunnels because year after year, you know, aphids normally, these potato aphids you think of in the wintertime, they go and overwinter on rose roses or prunus species. They go through a sexual reproductive stage on a different species but in a high tunnel they the environment stays warm all winter long and so these aphids don't go through a sexual reproductive stage they just continue giving birth to live aphids so uh, we're seeing more and more of these aphids continue through through seasons so um, this grower is now prepared this season to try his new strategy and um, that's the sample, that's the tunnels that we scouted for um, video clips that we're going to see next, I guess. Okay, great. And it looks like the calendar alert for him is in February when he's putting in the tomatoes and it looks like to contact you. Right. So, yeah, and I just discussed how, what, what our conversation was. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. Um, all right, what is your best advice for a farmer who wants to um, start using IPM plans? Oh, um, I guess maybe not trying to do it all at once. Focus. I just went through a plan for two sample pests, and you can see how complex and, and involved a plan can be. And when you're working on 30 or 40 crops, you know, it's hard to imagine getting really good at, at using IPM, but I think I really think that if you focus every few year on three, four, five different plans, you can be successful, and it's really important to feel successful when you have so many different moving parts. So that's one thing I would suggest. That sounds like focusing on, on the thing that probably uses the most amount of time or creates the largest amount of damage and just choose one thing and, and get used to how it works. Right. So. Yep. Okay. And once you really get a system down, you know, it's, it's great. And, and especially if you've implemented that system, you have this record, you have a plan. And oftentimes, you know, part of the plan is to scout and you'll be able to see if the, 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 um, treatments you've tried, whether your uh, controls were, if it was a cultural practice or a, a reduced um, risk pesticide, whatever it is, you'll have records of, of these activities. So years down the road, uh, you'll be a lot better off. Yeah. And uh, I remember Tyson saying, I think he had a plan that included about 10 different elements or 10 different um, pests or crops and but he said he had built it over time that um, yeah. and now something that was a big problem isn't a problem which allows him to focus on something else and so it just uh, creates an overall healthier farm and, and takes something that was time consuming he's not using his time on, on managing that anymore because of the because of initially putting the plan in place for that one uh, high labor intensive uh, problem so Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great. Um, so uh, when should when should someone create a plan? Um, we're, we're, it's now early May. Um, is it too late to think about it for this year or what is, when is the best time? Well, it depends on what kind of grower you are. Uh, if you're a, mostly a winter grower, you might your d downtime might be in the summertime 
but um most growers I know don't have much downtime at all. But basically when you sit down to do your normal crop planning is when you should do your IPM plan because, you know, one of your strategies is moving, you know, next season's crop to another field. So when you're sitting down to do all that, you should just do it all at once. Okay, great. And uh, I should mention, by the way, that uh, Carol Glanister, who you mentioned um, earlier, we did uh, an interview with her last year for the IPM toolbox um, oh, cool. about biological controls, and it was it was excellent. So if people are interested in that, go back to um, the Northeastern IPM website, and you'll find a link to uh, the interview that we did with her last year. So. And uh, okay, great. So let's take a moment to ask some questions. And Nancy, do we have uh, questions coming through about IPM planning? Yes, we do. Uh, let me scroll up here. The IPM plan sounds similar to a strategic plan. Is that true? In your mind, is that what you are thinking about when a new or existing grower wants to develop an IPM plan? <laughs> huh. um. I don't know I, what a farmer would say about having a strategic plan for their farm. Um, I've never really compared the two, but it's similar. Um, I can imagine developing this into a way where you have, you know, one year, five year, 10 year goals for your pest management strategies, but that, that's a new way of thinking about it. I hadn't thought of it before. Okay, the second question is, the growers seem to describe it well, not getting caught in the heat of the moment. Is it easy for you to see the difference between an operation that does have an IPM plan and one that doesn't? Right, so th that's a good question. I, we, when we start working with growers, like I, I mentioned before that we usually um, do these scouting trainings in, in three-year cycles and the first year is often a time of just identifying your problems. And it's often when I first meet with a grower that uh, they don't even know the problems they have. You know, it's like, oh, every year I just can't seem to get good pumpkins and we don't know why. Uh, so it, just identifying the problem is often the first step. And I can tell that, you know, that's, that's an easy place to start. That's usually where people start. Okay, last question is, when you run into problems or questions that you can't answer, do you use the scouting network? How much do you rely on the network versus others not part of the network? Oh, yeah. Um, a lot. So our, our plant disease diagnostician, Angie Medeiros, is part of our network. I bring samples to her all the time, and, um, you know, there's people from other states. We don't have a, a vegetable entomologist in Massachusetts or a weed specialist in Massachusetts anymore. In fact, it's hard to find a weed specialist for vegetables and fruit in all of New England. And so uh, I, I sometimes even go out of the region to, to, I, to ask for support. So yeah, knowing our, the professional networks is, is incredibly resourceful. Well, I'll use that as a good uh, plug for our webinar next week. We're going to have three uh, weed specialists um, in a webinar on this time next week, two o'clock uh, next Tuesday afternoon. So um, if anyone has weed questions, come back uh, next week because we'll have uh, three experts who hopefully will be able to uh, answer your questions. So great. Um, so um, now that somebody has a plan in place, the next thing to usually start doing is uh, scouting. So we're going to uh, switch the conversation to um, IPM scouting. And um, the first question I have is why scout? Uh, uh, well, Tyson said a little bit about why make a plan. And the next part of that is you know what's funny? And if you look at my IPM plan, my, oh, okay, so my calendar alert for tomatoes, I really should have added scout weekly after transplant because I just mentioned that potato aphid is a problem year round in these high tunnels. So this was a, this plan needs to be amended next year. I can already tell. Um, but th so the same reason that Tyson said that, that, uh, 
IPM planning can get you ahead preventatively uh, and take care of things. The scouting itself allows you to monitor pests and beneficials so that you know if you actually need to uh, step in and, and take an action and whether that action be cultural or chemical. Uh, another reason to scout is to actually see the efficacy of your treatment. You don't want to just make an application or, or take an action um, and then walk away and say, okay, well, I took care of that. You want to come back a week later and see if what you actually did, if you did anything. And, and I think the greatest reason to scout is just reducing stress, taking the guesswork out of, out of pest management. You, you have a, a scientific method. You can follow it. And you can go about your day and let plenty of other things stress you out, like the weather. <laughs> so that's why I scout. Okay, so this is uh, Katie Campbell uh, Nelson's prescription for a reduced stress life. So, <laughs> so let's dive into that. Um, we're, we uh, made some video of you uh, showing the toolkit that you use. And I'm just going to uh, switch to that video, if you'll just give me a moment. And... Uh, are you seeing the video uh, share? And let me see here. Yep. Yep, we can see that. Great, just want to check. Okay, so here is the video. Today we're scouting tomato. So I'm pulling out our tomato scouting sheet. I have a, any kind of ID guides you might find useful. You wanna bring those with you. We have our nice pest ID guide. So in our toolbox, we have pencil. Always have a pencil. This nice, these are $2 on Amazon. This is a hand lens, a 10X hand lens. And we have here Ziploc bags. These are really handy to have when you're scouting because if you find any disease symptoms, you want to be able to put them in the bag and not carry it through the field and potentially spread spores all over. So carry a, a handful of Ziploc bags with you. Um, and, you know, other things you might find useful if you find insects, a Petri dish is handy because it's easy to scrape them right off the plant and into your Petri dish. Um, I have yellow sticky cards for if we want to place those in the greenhouse. A lot of insects are attracted to these cards and you can keep them in the house for a week to monitor what kind of pests you have in there. Um, so we have a full, a complete list of what should go in this toolbox on our website and I can share that with you all. So now that we have everything we need to scout, we're going to head over to the greenhouse. Great. Today we're scouting tomato. Oops, so I'm pulling out our second. tomato scouting sheet. I have it. There you go. All right. So, uh, Katie, um, that's, uh, we're going to show a link that we have to, um, uh, to the toolkit inventory and um, and the link for that is uh, in the resources that we mentioned in one of the earlier slides is that correct right yep so this is your toolkit basically for everything you'll need to scout but we also included a list of for trap supplies if you're interested in using pheromone traps for uh, sweet corn or squash vine borer pests um, so all that information, how you use it, what it's for, links where you can find it. Okay. It's all on the site. And is this a, a costly thing to put together? No, I, I would say probably less than $100 for the scouting supplies themselves, but the trap supplies, some of those, the, um, some of the traps can be a little more expensive. The lures are very cheap. A Heliothus trap are about $100 a piece, but they last for years and years. Okay, so probably a good, in, a good, good investment. So good yeah. investment, so great. Um, so how long does it take to scout, a lentus scout? Uh, well, 
after you watch this video, I suppose you'll have learned how to scout tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it doesn't take that long to learn. The first time you do it, it may feel a little bit awkward, and you may spend about a half hour wandering through the field and trying to get comfortable with what you're seeing. But after that, a regular 10, 15 minutes, depending on the size of your field, certainly, um, is all it really takes for a crop. So it's very quick. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we're going to, um, to show uh, some video of you scouting tomatoes um, that we shot uh, earlier. And I'm just going to switch to that and um, let me see here. Um, Oh, you had asked earlier um, when we were preparing for this about how and when you know which crops to scout. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to scout tomatoes in a high tunnel. And right now, this time of year is a great time to do that. But uh, for in general, you know, we've thought about having calendars, but often a growing degree day model for certain insect pests can be very helpful. That, and, and a lot of those are available through the Network for Environmental and Weather Applications, uh -huh. the NUA website. We also compile a lot of information for, and, and put it out in vegetable notes in our pest alerts so that people are always prepared and know when to scout. And, I, you know, asking neighbors, neighboring farms, and that's a good way to know when. Okay, great. And I was going to say you uh, mentioned the two interviews that we had last year for the toolbox because we also um, interviewed the folks from NIWA um, about the tools that they have and there was um, in that some live demonstrations and how to use it. So it was fun and interactive and so if um, people want to learn more about that, go back to the recording from last year. So here is uh, some video of um, getting started on scouting tomatoes. So Jeremy, you would like us to scout in your tomatoes here? Yeah, yeah. I'm a little worried that we might have some aphids. We had a big aphid problem last year. I've kind of been looking and haven't really seen any. But okay. Be good to really stay on top of it. Great. And Amelia is your greenhouse intern, and she's going to join us so that she can learn to scout tomatoes. Yeah. Great. Um, so the procedure. You guys have the scouting sheets with you. And um, what we like to have is a, this sheet has a lot of the diseases right on it. So we'll also be looking for disease symptoms. And Jeremy, you have the scouting sheet itself. And the principles to scouting is we're going to go through the field and stop randomly. So we're going to take an even number of steps between each plant and stop and inspect the whole plant for any signs of diseases, insects, and beneficials that you might find. So to do that, you will start at the top of the plant and look on the undersides of the leaves, going all the way down. And these plants are still small. When, if this were a full, in a full green, grown greenhouse, you're going to stop and only look at three points on the plant, the lower, middle, and the top part of the plant. But when they're this small, they're seedlings, we want to make sure that they're going to make it through the season healthy, so we, we inspect the whole thing. So I'm just sort of carefully looking at the whole plant. And then if you don't see anything, we report the number to Jeremy and we say, plant number one, zero. And he's gonna record that for us. So when we get to the end, we're gonna have a tally of sort of the uh, pest pressure in this house. And then we'll be able to make a decision from there. Great, all right, wonderful. And, um, so, um, all right, let me switch back. All right, great. Um, so um, I think people have an idea of how you would get started. And um, I think you have a couple of things in the PowerPoint here to show the kind of materials that you were sharing with people. Right, so just as we started that scout, uh, Amelia was an intern and she's newer to this whole process. So uh, what I like to have for the field or to be able to give to newer um, people who are newer to this is, is have some ID guides. So here's a fact sheet about with good photos um, about fungal diseases of tomatoes. We always 
encourage folks to submit a sample to the diagnostic lab before taking any sort of action, uh, especially because the treatments you may use would be very different depending on whether you found a fungal pathogen or or a, a bacterial one or something else. So, um, you know, the diagnostic lab is everybody's friend. Uh, and then the other sheet that we discussed was these scouting forms. And we developed these for, I think, nine different vegetable crops. And this season, I'd, I'd like to develop a few more. Um, and it just gives you the steps. It says, you know, select plants at random, tells you how to look at the plants just as I did in that in that video clip, and then tells you sort of what kind of insect or uh, disease symptoms you may be seeing so that you can have an idea about how much pressure you have. Of course, if you have a date, uh, field name, location, and these go into a file, at the end of the season, next year, when you sit down to make your IPM plan, you can go back and say, when were those aphids present? When did they first show up? Um, and this sheet is a great way to record all that information. Great. So it gives you a history that you can go back to 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 in when making your plan so that you might cut. Right. And it also helps you make a decision right there on the spot. Uh, this is this is the takes out that stress and that guesswork. Oh, we lost your screen. Yep, I'm just putting to the next movie. Uh, oh yeah, no worries. Um yeah, so being able to make a decision on the spot based on how many, what percent infestation you have, for example. Uh, in, in the case of aphids, it's presence or absence, but in some, for some insect pests, it, it matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we're going to, uh, maybe you can introduce the next clip that we're going to be looking at. Oh, uh, yeah, this is just part of our scouting process in that high tunnel where uh, you'll just see how we use those sheets. Okay, here it goes. Oh, I don't see the screen. Okay. There it is. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, holy no. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Sorry. So, we're going to randomly stop at eight points down this row so that total we get about 25 plants that we've looked at. So, you can start maybe just go forward as many steps as you feel will get you to the end of the row. Eight, eight stops. And we'll start there. All right, Amelia, you've got to check this out. Cause, so what that means is, here, use, use this. What that means is that your wasps are working. So, can, oh no, it's okay. Can you, is it getting it, is it picking it up? <laughs> it is. There you oh, there we go. Yeah. So, so a parasitoid is a wasp usually that will lay its eggs inside of the aphid, and then when the egg hatches out, you should be able to find a hole in its body. Yeah, so if, can you see the, um, the hole in the body? That's where the wasp emerged after its egg hatched. Just like you. Just, Just like, like you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one way of checking to find out if the, the parasitoid that you released is working. So when you use Aphidius Irvi for potato aphid or foxglove aphid, um, it should be used, released when the populations are low. And when you have higher populations of aphid, you can use ladybugs. You can see a ladybug right here. Yeah, so right there you've got some ladybugs. Yeah, great. Okay, so you you can mark on your sheet there uh, two... Is this in a bag? No, because we know what it is and we know... So if we find something weird, we put it in the bag? But if yeah, something we... Understand, we just, you know, yeah. I'm going to write down one LB parasitize. Excellent. Here, you can keep this one with you because I'm used to seeing <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Is that, uh, is that another? From, uh, from, uh, is that uh, something that they leave behind or is that like vermiculite? Oh, that's just vermiculite. Okay, great. Now we're going to move on to the uh, next one. Um, hi. Sorry, I'm having problems sharing my screen with the with these videos. So give me one second, and maybe Katie, you could talk about the next clip that we're going to be seeing. Uh, I think it's probably more. I don't quite remember what they all, are, but there's another bit where we talk about uh, the 
sort of disease symptoms we might be finding. Yep, there we go. And here it is. Here's Amelia again. Holy, oh crap. Oh crap, it's got babies. Yeah, so oh, no. So there you can say, we, uh, Jeremy, usually when we record them, we say you have more, if you have greater than five on a leaf, you just mark that down. So we got her second plant here has more than five aphids. Yep, yeah. so there you uh, none parasitized. That's one? another aphid. Potato aphids have two color forms. They can be green and pink. No. Oh. Uh, this is my third plant, and I got one parasitized and a whole bunch of not parasitized. And one whole bunch of not parasitized. More than five. More than five. And Jeremy, I've got one plant here with more than five. Oh man, I'm glad you're doing this now. This is going to be fun later on. Great. So, um, Katie, I noticed that um, right at the end, Amelia said that um, she was glad that they'd found this now rather than, than later on. And um, when is the best time to scout uh, tomatoes in, in high tunnels? <laughs> That's the well. That's a good question. Um, weekly, from the time that you transplant them into the tunnel, would be a good thing to do. Uh, high tunnel tomatoes are pretty a uh, pretty high market value crop, so uh, paying close attention to them is really important. And especially, I think our last clip, you you'll see why monitoring weekly is a good idea because it has to do with the life cycle of what of the beneficials that are being released as well as the life cycle of the aphid so uh benef if the beneficial aphidius ervi is being released and it'll start you'll start seeing parasitoids two weeks after you release so if you go out there and you're not seeing any parasitism you think oh well that release didn't work so let's see the clip and okay and you'll see what i'm referring to i think okay here we go Yeah, that could be Botrytis. Well, let's... All right, so we have right. these. Yeah, we keep these bags so that if you see any anything that might be sporulating, you put it in the bag so you don't spread it throughout oh my greenhouse. Gosh. I know, right? Um, so leaf mold is a potential or gray mold. It could just be sunburn because I don't see any spores on that one. Well, what do spores look like? Well, so it, it, this describes the different types of um, pathogens have different kinds of spores. So yeah. Uh, yeah. It, the, the powdery mildew with the hand lens, you actually can even see they make chains. They call, they're called conidial chains, and you can see them all linked up. All right, so I think we've scouted all. Well, you need more help on this row, right? Yeah, you've so got, got, got uh, That's right. 18, 18. All right, well, I'll stop. I'll do a few more. Well, we just count the number of plants that had aphids on them. Number of plants, okay, so it's six, six plants. Six plants, yep. So you have 24% infestation by aphids. And to simplify this, you it's can just say at them. any point you see aphids in your greenhouse, that's a time to do something about it. Yeah. So if you have even like, the, even if you just find one or two, you get them off they're gonna... Yeah, when you have a lower population, it's a good time to release wasps. If you this is a publication of veg notes from last year, managing aphids in early season tunnels. All right. <laughs> I, thought <of> <laughs> I thought of it all. So, the best control with the parasitoids you want are released once a week or three weeks. That makes sense. And you're kind of overlapping populations, overlapping generations. Well, so if you if we released them two weeks ago, I should actually order them for if I did, next week would be three weeks. So there might be like a new generation emerging. So yeah. I just want to like wait. Yeah. I mean, we saw aphids at several different stages. You know, we saw adults and then we saw smaller ones as well. So, because aphids just give birth to live babies. 
aphids really are like aliens. They're disgusting. So, yeah, that probably m would make sense. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, thanks. Thus concludes, concludes our scouting. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, uh, so Katie, what's interesting about about that video? Why did we choose that uh, that that uh, uh, that clip? Well, uh, it actually, just watching that clip, I think I learned something. Um, I learned something from the growers all the time when I'm doing this work, and we're out there making observations because they're the ones that are practice. You know, all, all I do is give a recommendation, and then they're the ones that actually try it and tell me if it worked or not. Um, so I think Jeremy there was talking about the his release cycle for his his wasps, and it was important that he went out there every week to to check on how many uh, parasitoids were he was finding because the the wasps may have a two or three week window in which they're active, and then he needs to be re releasing them again and again. Um, uh, so that's what I think he was referring to, where I hadn't really considered that wa the release of the wasps timing time frame. Great. Well, hopefully that word, that video was helpful for people to see some scouting and in it live and what the kind of things people would be finding and how to deal with them. So, um, Nancy, do we have uh, any questions that have come in about uh, scouting in general or scouting for tomatoes? Uh, yes, we do. And some of these go back uh, just a little bit. Uh, I've heard of researchers collecting soil samples for DNA analysis in the lab to determine where pests like nematodes are, which are the good and bad ones. Do you see this as being an additional tool to take out in the field in the future? It, that's funny you ask that because I just went through the process of trying to get aphids identified. I scouted another high tunnel, very similar to the one that we saw in this video, and found only green aphids and could not for the life of me figure out if they were foxglove or potato aphid. It turns out that biological controls for both of those are similar, so it's not that important that you get the difference between those two aphids. Um, but in terms of which population is building up, you know, if I haven't seen any foxglove aphid around yet, uh, I'm seeing potato aphid. So, so I couldn't identify it. And so what I thought, all right, you know what we can do? I went to our woody plant entomologist we work together and we submitted a sample to APHIS. Uh, it's the Animal Plant Health oh, Inspection cool. Service. Is that what APHIS stands for? Yep. Yeah. So we submitted the sample and they couldn't identify it. And they ca came back to us and, and they said, well, you didn't submit a winged adult. And we said, well, we just assumed, well, aren't you USDA? Don't you just throw, <laughs> you know, don't you just throw the sample in the PCR and tell me use some DNA analysis and tell me what it is. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I would love to use that technology in the field and it's totally possible. But I think until somebody thinks that our pest issues are as important as cancer research or something else, I just, the funding doesn't really go down that route. And I think it'll take a while. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, next question, how much do you take into account the fluctuations in abiotic and biotic conditions to impact what you are seeing? I am thinking of a sudden or prolonged drought or swarms of insects moving through an area. Ah, okay. Uh, well, so first thing you want to do in your IPM plan is make sure that you have a healthy crop. So you, you deal with your abiotic stresses first and you try and control them as much as possible. Uh, so that you can reduce the impact that any pest populations may have on them. Uh, but yes, you certainly do record the differences. I mean, you saw an example of that in our scouting. We tried to figure out if what we were seeing was, was you know, sun scald or a fungal pathogen. And your response to treating that issue would be different. So this is early in the season. Those, those little seedlings were still fairly small. And when it gets pretty hot in there, growers will roll up the sides of their high tunnels and wind comes in and if there's, if the leaves are wet at all, you can get 
quickly get desiccation on the leaf surfaces and get this sun scald. So knowing that that's what he had in his tunnels, he's, his response is to roll the sides up a little bit less earlier in the day and get those plants, you know, and, and harden them off a little bit more and, and they'll grow out of it. So it's, yeah, certainly. Biotic and biotic. Yeah. Last question is, uh, do you know if there are any apps for scouting to identify pests like the leaf snap app? Scouting looks like fun. Uh, um, I don't know the leaf snap app. I do know that there's one you can, you can take photos and submit to, um, I think the Connecticut diagnostic lab, but usually I try not to identify things by photo, especially diseases. Um, but insects, certainly, uh, I don't, I, that's actually I, something I'd love to work on is converting our IPM guide, which is a PDF, you can, you know, you can open up as a PDF document on your phone, but you still have to search through and try and find the crop. I, that would be a great thing to develop better. I, I know there's samples out there, but they're normally for big commodity crops like corn and soy. Uh, there isn't one for diversified veg growers. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nancy. And thanks, uh, Katie. And um, I'm going to switch slides because uh, we have a few more resources that are listed here um, on uh, pollinators. Um, there's links to our IPM toolbox series talk from last year. And um, and Katie, I have uh, one uh, last question for you. What's the biggest mistake that people make when creating and using IPM plans or scouting um, for the first time? Uh, I guess just don't try and do too much. I think we all try to do too much all the time. If you can, if you can take that and extrapolate it to the rest of your life, great. <laughs> but yeah, just don't don't try and do too much with your plan right first off because you might get discouraged and and I think this can be done very practically and uh, can be very successful. Great, wonderful. Well, there you go. We've had an interesting conversation on how to reduce uh, stress in farming and gardening. So <laughs> we can thank Katie for that. So, well, thank you very, very much, Katie, for taking time this afternoon to be on this webinar. And thank you for all the people that were on the call and their, their questions that you were asking. Um, it's been fun and I hope you'll join us. We have two more webinars coming up. Uh, one next week on Tuesday afternoon at this time on weeds and on Thursday afternoon from two till three, we'll be uh, talking with Chang Lu Wang on his IPM approach on cockroaches um, that he's used very successfully in New Jersey. So I hope that you will be joining us for both of those and thank you for your time. So thanks, Katie. Great, thank you. Bye. Bye.